and welcome to the show. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, before I introduce this week's guest, just a couple of notices. Um, you know, our locals program is you know, spreading out throughout the whole country, I'm pleased to say. I have two events, um, the first one of which is today. I've already given you notice of this, but just in case you want to go along, it's in Norwich and it's this afternoon and uh, the speaker at our Norwich Group's event will be Paul Embry, uh, commentator and author of the book Despised, Why the Modern Left Loathes the Working Class. I think it should be fascinating. So if you have still got time um, after you've watched this, uh, do get in touch um, at locals at newcultureforum.org.uk. And then on Tuesday coming, uh, that's the 20th of February, we shall be having a social event in Reading. So if you're in Reading or nearby and want to come, uh, again, please do get in touch via locals at newcultureforum.org.uk and we will tell you the details of when and where. Now, I'm delighted that my guest today is a real friend of the channel. He's been on, I think this is the fifth time, uh, Lawrence Fox, uh, who is leader of the Reclaim Party and very rarely out of the news. Thank you very much for coming, Lawrence. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted actually to ask you, because we, while we're being a bit current, um, last week we saw Rishi Sunak on GB News. Did you watch it? I didn't. I caught bits of it. Right. What was your impression? Well, my impression is that it seems that none of the issues... You tweeted about it. It's, you know, none of the issues that really are bothering the voters that aren't, you know, attempted to not vote, who would be traditionally voting Conservative, yeah. he didn't talk about any of those issues. Yes. The things that bother people, and it sort of makes me feel that there's an establishment, political establishment, that will not talk about the things that mm. the people care about. So I found that disappointing. I don't think Rishi Sunak... I mean, let's face it, he's not elected and neither is the Foreign Secretary mm. at the moment. So it's just, a, it's a very bad time for the Conservatives, isn't it, really? Yes, it, I mean, I, do you go along with the view that, say, for example, Ben Habib has said about, or many of us actually, including me, that the Tory party should just simply be wiped out next time? No, I don't, because I have the view that Ben Habib should be standing for the Tories. Right. And would have been an amazing Tory and would have, probably take it would probably take the seat because he's a very dedicated Britain loving people person and um, it's uh, it, it's very difficult isn't it because on one level you want the Tories to be punished because they're not conservative and they seem to be a large portion of the party seems to be full of Lib Dems or liberals yeah uh, of and they need to sort of purge that part of the party and be conservative so you want them to be punished but at the same time you don't want the Race Equality Act and Labour with a with a massive majority come the general this year because that stuff is going to go through and once mm. we know about legislation in this country once you put in a, an act they don't repeal them mm. do they? They'd the thing is you see about this we were talking just before we came on about this is that people you know people go about their everyday lives they can't be expected to know the ins and outs of uh, you know legislation necessarily um, but the one you mentioned there, which is this um, Race Equality Act, which is basically what Labour would bring in and if it were came into power, which it probably will. Um, this is the act which is more or less based on what I can see on critical race theory, isn't it? Yeah, it's a diversity, equity and inclusion act, yeah. essentially. So it's going to instantiate institutional racism in law and ESG and all the, these things in law. So we are going to see people protected and discriminated based on something as ridiculous as yeah. the colour of your skin in a country which is the most one of the most progressive countries on earth yeah. and I find that a deeply dreadful thing for a, for a Labour Party uh, who thrive on division mm -hmm. to um, to put before the public and before they know it they'll have that you know people's children will not be getting university places, they will not be getting jobs, and it, this will be down to the colour of their skin, which in my view is, is racism. Yeah. So it should just be called the Racist Act, yeah. in the same way as the Equality Act should be called the Inequality Act. The thing is, uh, with this new Act it, as well, is that they're going to embody in it a particular definition of Islamophobia, which, um, you know, well, to be fair, the Tories, for example, have not gone along with, but they're about the only party who's not. It's this very contentious one, which is that, um, you know, you can be Islamophobic 
if um, it's based on someone's uh, hurt is, is, is suffered by someone on, who is perceived to be Muslim, their perceived Muslimness. These are the words they use. Now, what the hell is that about? Well, it's incredibly dangerous. Yeah. Why you, you know, legislation should be objective, not yeah. not subjective. Yeah. And again, you know, the old argument, which is that if if it's down to someone's perception, then you do even more damage to free speech because you're concerned about how someone perceives you. And mm -hmm. we do, we don't no, we've never operated like that as a yeah. society. Politeness got in protected us in that way. To be polite was the most important thing. We we are a very polite society. But what's happened is the more that our speech is being squeezed and regulated and you're, you're getting the further extremes of, of free speech coming out, but the real debate across the finer issues are is being completely ignored. And, it, and it's also, you know, why Islamophobia? Why, why not anti-Semitism? Mm, mm. Why not anti-white racism? Mm. All of this stuff, you know, because it's essentially the only uh, permissible racism that I've noticed at all in this this country in the recent years has been anti-white racism and, and the, the growing scourge of, of uh, anti-Semitism. Yes, yes. Especially within the Labour Party. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, in fact, obviously as well, this past week, it seems to be really kind of um, flying back in their faces, doesn't it, the Labour Party, at least, you know. The, I mean, I don't know how much it's kind of, what difference it's going to make, because they'll somehow or other triangulate it, somehow or other, but this whole, the way in which Labour now is, to, you know, why did people ever think they were going to be any different? I mean, what evidence was there, or, you know? Yeah, I mean, Labour have, have made a real rod for their own back, haven't yes, they? Yes, exactly. By, by pushing the diversity agenda and, and, you know, helping with the uncontrolled immigration. And then, you know, in order to get elected into power in this country, Keir Starmer only had one option, which was to turn around and defend Israel, he had yeah. to do it as, mm -hmm. a, as the leader of a political party. But then you see within the ranks of Labour and, the, the, and what it's become, I suppose socialism's always been this way, the oppressed and oppressor narrative, that Israel are the demons and you can't, you, you know, you, you must condemn them. And yeah. you've seen with Asher Ali and all, all of this stuff, it's that I feel very like Britain's not Britain mm. anymore. What on earth has Palestine got to do with us, mm. really? I mean, other than the Balfour Declaration mm -hmm. and going back all that time, but what does it really have? You don't f hear people condemning. People aren't on the streets marching for Zelensky or marching for you know Putin or mm -hmm. what, whatever it is, but it's this very specific, mm -hmm. sudden march. And it's a way of releasing, in my view, a pent-up racism that comes with the, with, you know, the socialist yes. ide ideas. And, and it's very sad to see I walked around Lots of the London protests, and I, I, you know, I'm sympathetic to that video that went viral. It's like, go home, Abdul. And it's yeah. like these people are not. A lot of them. That's not to say there aren't many, many people of, of all different skin colours and ethnicities and sexual orientations that really do put Britain first. But a lot of these people, these marchers, they don't care about Britain. Yeah. They're, they're holding a global protest in my capital city, and I walked to the office this morning, and I went past the cenotaph, and it's still cordoned mm -hmm. off. And if you don't protect your borders, you're going to have to protect your monuments. And mm. it's an absolutely appalling to think that these young men went over the top on this, you know, mm. you know, ardent for some dis distant glory uh, narrative that was sold to them, and they died in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands for this country, mm. only for this country not to protect its own people anymore, and the very monument which represents yeah. their loss. Yes, exactly. I mean, again, you know, with this this sense of it not being. A, country it's not just hyperbole this um, you know there was always a sort of a feeling one could say that but it was sort of almost said in the knowledge that actually maybe you know one was just forewarning whereas now I really do feel actually it just does not feel like Britain um, and I'm sure that the vast majority of people are aware of it you know, there is this feeling of the ground having given way. I mean, you mentioned the senator of the um, past week. We've had two institutions, the army and the church, both actively working, it would seem, against Britain, actually. Because with the army, they said that uh, all kind of religious aspects should be avoided in remembrance services, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, this is, don't you think this is what, what strikes me is when People say, oh, you're just, you know, you're, you're making a, you know, a mountain out of a molehill, or it's nothing like as bad as you say. 
I think I've got a rule now. It's actually much worse than you think it is. The minute they say it's not happening, it's happening. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely, you know, the uh, the RAF had a problem, didn't they, when yeah, they said yeah. with with white white pilots. Useless white pilots. Yeah. But I can promise you, you know, with I obviously made my mistake with the Sikh soldier in 1917, but the the overwhelming majority of men who died for this country were did so in the name of God, King and Country. Yes. And they were and they would have been white British people. Yeah, yeah. And in America, they, this is why they're finding such problems with recruitment in the army, is because uh, white working class Americans are overrepresented by I think it's a huge percentage mm -hmm. in people that come back in coffins from war zones. Mm -hmm. um, so Absolutely, it's appalling to one's own military to mm. to go that way. But mm. I suppose you know they don't have any really have anything to do, do they? They don't have any. All they've got to do is polish their ships. So of course they've got time for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Yes. It's, it's it's riddled everywhere, and it's put in place to tell us how to think and to stop us having any view whatsoever about the fact that Britain is going to be is you know within a couple of generations going to be the westernmost part of the greatest Islamic caliphate on earth and we're going to live it whether we like it or not. You, um, when you've been on the show before, uh, quite often it's been after something's happened to you. <laughs> I mean, you know, surprise, surprise, yeah. you know, but um, obviously there was the court case recently, Lawrence. You've been through it, I know, many times. Um, but um, I just wanted to read a tweet you put out, because it sort of plunges us right into the middle of what was happening. But you can explain it best, I think. Um, this was one just a few weeks ago. And you, here we go. Um, I think you were going away for a break. Um, see you soon. Um, having had a judge decide she can't define one of the simplest words in our language. And as a direct result, some blowhard got in my face to say he wanted to kill me in the street. I think a break is in order. Um, I used to be sad to leave my home, not anymore. Um, judge deciding that she can't define one of the simplest words in the language. Most people, when they saw the story you were involved in, would have said, it would have said Lawrence Fox loses libel trial. What exactly was this about? So we obviously we we know what happened roughly sainsbury said that they were going to create se segregated spaces yeah. for or safe spaces as they call them for black people i said that was segregationist and you know reminded me of jim crow era america and therefore not to go to sainsbury's i was called a racist i responded rhetorically by calling people pedophiles because i thought you can't call me a racist and get away with it and i'll just use an equally slanderous word back we then uh, over the period of three and a half years have been through various bits of court to get to an appeal last year where one of those cases was thrown out one of mm -hmm. my responses saying you're a paedophile anyone who hires you is a paedophile and that was thrown out and the, the court of appeals saw that as a rhetorical device mm -hmm. but so we get to trial and we're quite excited now that we're, we're on the front foot and um we're going to get through. I was nervous that we didn't have a jury because I think that judge only trials, it, it's very hard to put all of this on a judge. Yeah. And every person should have the, the right to be, um, have their case heard before a jury of their own peers. Anyway, she decided, having been told by the Court of Appeal, she was told to define the meaning of the word racist. But as part of how defamation law works, she doesn't have to do that if she finds that I've suffered no serious harm. Now, I would say the loss of a 22-year acting career is serious harm. Yeah, yeah. That's, I'd say that's a fairly solid yeah. argument. And I, I think, and I've read through the, the transcripts uh, twice now, that I think our Casey destroyed their case on serious harm. So what she did was she said, I hadn't suffered any serious harm, therefore she doesn't have to define the word racist. Right. So we basically made a word, a really important word in our language, extinct now, because it just doesn't mean anything or she refuses to define what it means, and that any other insult or rhetorical flourish is banned. So again, it's just another very, very difficult, we're appealing it. I, I was, yeah. They said, we'll send you uh, the grounds for appeal, but you know, it's very draining. Yes. Just to try and say any sensible person knew exactly what I was doing. Yes, exactly, it's, it's quite clear. Yeah, and wh whether you think it's cat and wrong, that's totally fine, but it was very obvious what I was doing. And um, my view, and I'm allowed to say, 
I respectfully disagree with the judge because that's what my lawyers say. My view is that you know we're all subject to our own bias, and it was almost like there didn't need to be a trial because there's so none, none of the evidence is really referred to in the judgment. It becomes points of law. So um, it's I was very 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 downhearted, and I thought you know. As we say, you know, looking at what's going on in London, hearing some of the things that are said by um, extremist preachers and various things like that, you know, basically inciting people to do do some pretty horrendous things. Uh, but I'll have six police officers around my house, and we've seen this morning this guy who was objecting to a Palestinian march going past his house, and the police were sprinting up to him and telling him to shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, uh, and if our, our institutions aren't going to protect us. I don't feel like I'm at home. And I, as much as I tweeted, I used to be sad to leave my country, I used to look forward to coming home. And I dreaded coming mm -hmm. home. I sat there with my face in the sun till the last possible minute. And I come home and I, you just feel that oppression again. It's, it's sirens, it's, it's, you, you don't trust the police. You've got, a, you've got a, a London mayor who's a complete and total fiendish ideologue and he won't deal with what his job is to do yeah. which is to keep London as safe. Yes. Speaking of which you you might stand against him again? I, th I think I have to even if it's just as an enormous roar that people can you know either get behind or not but it, I don't think the Conservatives put their best foot forward in the London mayoralty mm. and I think that's a shame and um, I think someone has to sit there and say what has this man done but ruin our city. Mm. He's ruined it. I mean, you left mm. because he ruined mm. it. Mm. And you know, I'm. I love London, and I. But most importantly, I love Britain. Mm. And I think what people forget is that this is our home. Mm. We don't have anywhere else to go. Mm. And yeah. they're not. We, we must protect it because our children are going to have to grow up here. Mm. And if you want uh, people marching through London every Saturday. Uh, taking global conflicts onto the streets of London or, or saying the most appalling and offensive things and a huge rise in actual racism, mm. which is what we all know, yeah. and the police protecting them and two-tier mm. policing, you lose all faith in the police. And I'm desperate to hold on to some faith in some institutions in this country, just some one. And for me, the judiciary would be the one. And, and we, were, we were all just flabbergasted mm. at the judgment. So... Um, we just we will appeal it, and look, fortunately, you know, there's good precedent in our appealing. Last time we appealed, we won, and hopefully we'll do it again. But it's very expensive, and it's really draining. And yeah. our, our people have got to start standing up because it's mm. it's we're running out of time. You know the the the, the uh, usual, um, you know, not excuse exactly, but the explanation for not standing up is, which I've always said, oh, people have got mortgages, people, are, you know, they work and all of this. But I think we're coming to the stage where we're not where Actually, you've got to say, even regardless of that, maybe you're going to have to sort of put up, um, you know, when it comes to these sort of issues. It will happen. It's yeah. just we, I would much rather it happened in a gentle and organised and non-anarchic sort of, you know, the, the, side, the, the, the peaceful revolution of Brexit was what it was. Mm -hmm. But I think this cultural thing where, where we're having, you know, grisly and gro groveling apologies for scuffing Qurans, mm. and yet we can have uh, police having to guard our own monuments. I think we, there, there, there has to be some balance. And I know it frustrates people hugely, but as you say, they have mortgages. There will come a point, and probably halfway through a Labour government, mm. I imagine, when people just go, enough. Yeah. Speaking of that, you know, I'm feeling alienated. You mentioned you you've got a residual trust maybe in the judiciary, right? I'd like to. You'd like to have, and that's about it, right? Yeah, I can't think of another institution that I have any faith in whatsoever. Can you? Um, well, yes. I mean, I, I would say that the it's more than in my case more than not having faith in the in the police. It's outright contempt now. I'm mm. afraid. I mean, that comes from my experience being on the assembly and everything, but all the way through, people kept saying, oh, it's not just the, it's, it's the top brass. I, do you know, Lawrence, I don't even think that anymore. Mm. I think they've all been through this cookie cutter stuff. They've all taken it on board. And, and listening to some of those guys on those demonstrations, saying, oh, well, there are more of them than there are of us. In a strange way, actually, uh, he's, 
correct. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's almost like they have, they've actually realized, look, actually, you know, we're done for here. So basically, we've just got to just contain them. Pick a side, I'd say, is what they've done. Mm. They pick a side. They, go, they, they know which side their bread is buttered. And they know, look, we've had an 11 million increase in our population since uh, Blair took over. Yeah. Uh, the British are reproducing and replacing themselves at what 1.6 and that's said mm. we're not even replacing our own population mm. so someone explain to me where these 11 million people came from yes yes you know which is over more than 10 percent of the population mm. so it's the most profound change in over 2,000 years mm. that we've had in 30 years in this mm. country and no one seems to and if you raise your voice about it or talk about it or talk about it in a calm and reasonable way you're immediately called a racist or an I, islamophobe yeah i i noticed some things uh change, changing i you never now hear a case really being put for mass migration um even the economic arguments are now really being challenged actually i mean on in europe and and i'm sure it will follow here too you yeah. know that Oh, this is good for the economy, and I think that even that is sort of going. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about your court case there, uh, losing a twenty-two year acting career. Right? Um, I know this is a crazy question. Do you miss it? Well, yes. If if I was, if it didn't matter, I mean, if it didn't matter what political views you held, which well, this is the never point. mattered to me. Yeah. So I used to, as I said, I think I've said to you before, I spent loads of time talking to Kevin Waitley, who was a solid lefty. We used to debate politics often and it just wasn't a big issue. But I think if I walked on an acting set now, probably the first thing I'd bump into is an actress who goes, I can't, he's triggering me too much or, you know, it would, mm. so, and I think that's the death of decent drama anyway. I, you know, I watched Heat, that film Heat the other day, which is oh, a ma yeah. masterpiece yep. uh, of sort of, you know, American yeeharism. Ye yeah. And I just thought, there's not, no one's made a decent film in such a long time. So art has suffered, comedy has suffered, and it's all, everything's just permanently racist. Yeah. I would like to see, um, you know, and I really need to think about this carefully, actually, is to go, well, we need to start funding some of this stuff mm. the, to, to find a cultural problem to a cultural solution to a cultural problem. Because whether there's a political solution to a cultural problem, I don't know whether there is. I think, as you say, most people just want to bury their heads in the sand and let the politicians get on with it. Mm. And actually, really culturally, which is what you do and what uh, you know, I do is try and just talk about the culture. Because that's, that's what holds a country together. And we have no sense of identity. Young, the young people are profoundly depressed. They don't want to have children because they're convinced by the doomsday cultists that there's not going to be a planet here in a few years anyway. Mm. And life, the spiritual elements of life are hope and optimism and meaning. And you know the covenant of passing on to a country, to a better country than the one yeah. you inherited, all of those things seem to have vanished. Mm. So the British national identity which I knew very strongly as a, as a child, is completely evaporated. Mm. I don't know what the British national identity is. It, one day you'll get a tweet from Sadiq Khan saying, well, we're celebrating this religion this month, this religion this month, mm. uh, the alphabet people this month. You know? mm. And it's just, he, he thinks that it, all of this works together. And I, I keep saying to people, Muslim friends, I say to them, which law trumps is the highest law? Is Sharia law the highest law or is British law the yeah. highest law? And it's a difficult answer to get mm. out of someone because, you know, it, it, religions d don't have borders particularly, mm. but Britain is fundamentally, our values and our institutions and everything were built around Christian values. Mm. And we seem to have gone, nah, mm. you know, and actually the church are massively culpable for it because in their sort of misunderstanding of what uh, the sort of love one another of, what Jesus was saying. He also said some other stuff about, you know, there is only one God and all these sorts of things. So I'm not, I'm, I, for the first time, I think, whoa, this is going to get, this isn't halt, this, we can't halt this. And we've had for 13, 14 years, we've had a conservative government. So whereas in Europe, they have had different governments. Mm. We think here, because you know, there aren't huge numbers of people who are politically, massively politically engaged. We think that we've had a conservative government and it hasn't worked. So we'll give the Labour mm. lot a go. I mean, we'll see what happens with reform. But um, it, I, I think England's in a very bad place compared to Europe because you know, they're reacting to 
huge amounts of immigration and the fact that they had left-leaning governments that allowed it to happen, whereas we have a right-leaning government that has allowed it to happen. And they think by switching it back to Labour, giving the other side a go, if you will, it's going to make it any better, it's going to make it so much, so much worse. The thing is, though, is in Europe, say, uh, we've had Gert Wilders elected. I know he's still, I believe, trying to get an administration together. You know, it's not quite... But nevertheless, something which would have been unthinkable 15 years ago, um, when he was... Well, I think he has always lived under kind of form of house arrest, you know? Mm. But or Maloney, or, or these other sort of people, in, or certainly Le, Le Pen in France. Um, we are the outlier. Aren't we? we have nothing, I mean, of that stature. Yeah, well, we've got Nigel. And, right. Uh, right. you know, Nigel was the one that was hammering away for all those years, and he has a, he has a big following. Um, but even he is, you know, he's not sort of hammered his uh, tail to his donkey, or whatever the phrase is, nailed yeah. to the post. So what we've got is a lot of disparate um, parties who, you know, desperately trying not to tread on each other's feet mm -hmm. or in some cases actively trying to really damage the others instead of collaborating, working together. And I, I think I said to you before, if, um, if ourselves and the SDP and Reform and, um, you know, UKIP and, you know, Heritage and, and all of these little parties had come together and had a solid membership base and a solid big supporter base. I think when Suella Braveman got chucked from her position, I think she would have given it half a thought mm. to go, you know, this is a big people-led movement. Mm. But the facts are that reform are going it alone and we just have to wish them the best of luck. Would you, I mean, I, I mean, reform, Ben, I would say Ben is uh, uh, exactly the kind of politician we need in the sense he didn't even come into this until about he was 50. And uh, he'll be very open about that. He's so frank uh, generally about things. Uh, problem is, though, I don't know what you think about this, but I feel that there's, when it comes to immigration, the very least that can happen is a complete outright moratorium on it for a while. Five years. But... Reform aren't offering that, are they? No, they're offering one in, one out. Yes, one in, one out. It's a t I, I hate to say it, but it's not a policy I think is in any way, it doesn't address the problem no. at all. No. But, it, I, you know, I hate to I don't want to sound boo-hoo-ish, by the way. So it, this yes. isn't me being boo-hoo-ish. Yes. It, it, it seems to me that in order to be accepted into the political establishment in this country, you've got to drop every policy that would be popular with people. Mm. So it seems like reform of, you know, they've just been accepted in. And then we use that dreadful word, controlled opposition, which I hate. But it is more like, right, in order to come into the establishment, you're gonna to have to shelve some of the sort of rougher edges, which, well, what the political establishment think are rougher edges, but what your average person in the street mm -hmm. thinks is a totally common sense point of view, which is you need an absolute one, complete moratorium on immigration. And you then need to sit down and bring together the great thinkers of this country and, and remind ourselves what the values are that we uphold and start putting them into schools, mm. basing education on British values, and then within that, allowing children to do, to teaching them how to think. Mm. I mean, you know, yeah, how to think. And discuss those values. Yeah. Not, not sticking a bunch of gender ideology in schools and asking them to think about whether they agree with that, that's not got anything to do with what their future's going to bear for them. Yeah, but the thing is, you see, with that, I think we're, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of almost one step back from that in the sense that, yes, you've got to do that, but I feel that the teachers in our schools will not do it because they're so politicised. Mm. So, in fact, they've got to go. Well, fortunately, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, 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 uh, well, look, they, it's incremental. It happened incrementally, and it's going to have to be un done incrementally. Yeah. Yeah. You've seen they, that um, the NHS have kicked out the rainbow badge thing from mm. Stonewall. That's just a small victory. But we need, the depolicisation of national institutions is crucial. Or you, or there should be, you know, within the charter of each national institution should be that they uphold the nation mm. that mm. they're paid for by our by the taxpayer. And I keep thinking of, you know, this racist countryside drivel. Yeah, yeah. And this is charities that lovely people with good intentions are donating to thinking that they're protecting mm. wildlife or they're protecting birds but they're not mm. they're supporting the the infiltration of political ideologues within charity within institutions and, and you know my deep area of passion is school so we're mm. doing our we're going to judicially review this 
uh, school's guidance, this, ge mm -hmm. this gender ideology mm -hmm. guidance, and, mm -hmm. and you know, the, f the, f the philosophical indoctrination of children in school, mm -hmm. which is just absolutely wrong. And my kids get it. I mean, the, and clever as they are, they do it in the private schools much more than they do it in the state schools. Yes. Because they know that the private school kids are going to get so many hands up in life that they'll probably be in charge of the very institutions that the people who want them indoctrinated to uh, hold at the time of... The what kind time. of things do, do you pick up that they, that they get taught? Well, that I had the thing with consent with right. my eldest son, where they were trying to teach them what consent is, that you have to consent to, to you know, if your parent asks you to come and sit down and have dinner, mm -hmm. if the child doesn't consent, mm -hmm. they're, they're, it, it's, it's absolutely to, to, to rip apart the very fabric of the whole of society, which is the family, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what I noticed. My kids are smart, and obviously, you know, they've got a bit of a bulldozer of a dad, so I, um, I, I remind them to question Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th there's, there's interestingly, there's quite a solid bunch of young kids who are very bored of the narcissistic mm. people who take over the whole lesson because they've got to come out as non-binary or whatever it is that they are that week. You know, yeah. it's really bad to have a country run by narcissists, isn't it? Yes. I'd yeah. rather a country run by psychopaths. <laughs> um, be careful what you wish for. Well, Putin. You know, at the end of the day. You, you look at Putin, he's, I think he's probably a psychopath, I'd imagine. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. he seems to know how to run a country, doesn't mm -hmm. he? Just do, I want to go back, sorry, uh, uh, rather worrying at this thing. When you're talking about acting, because this, that is, if, if you like, the, not the sharp end of culture, but I mean, it is one of the great expressions of our culture. Um, and, you know, you were an actor for 22 years. It seems to me now that... It's not just the general kind of group think of people in, in the arts, but it's actually sort of embedded. If you look at the rules of BAFTA, for mm. example, or indeed the Oscars, uh, all these sort of diversity boxes have to be ticked, or they've, they've kind of voluntarily gone with along, along with this, haven't they? I mean, it seems to me, Lawrence, I mean, uh, there's got to be a reason why one doesn't really care so much about these things anymore, things that I have always cared an awful lot about. Yeah. And I think it's because creativity itself is basically dying. I mean, do you, don't you think you're right well, far you, nearer to it than I am? Yeah, you can't. How can you make a good drama if you're not free to express yeah. yourself? Yeah. If you're too frightened to express yourself, you're not going to make good drama. Mm. And, um, you know, the but BAFTA's uh, diversity quotas of 50% representation in a country of 80% white people. Mm. You, w but if you turn around and you said, OK, well, we've got 70% representation of mixed race people in the England football team, mm -hmm. we need to get rid of a few and replace them with some white people. Yeah. Or like it the BBC, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah. It doesn't work in, in mm. both directions. So it's mm. a one-way diversity for some only, yeah. which is anyone who isn't, you know, doesn't have to be pale, stale, white, male. Uh, it's diversity for everyone but that. Equity for, uh, to, br to bring down the standard of intelligence, the standard quality of drama down to the very lowest common denominator, which is, you know, drag queen story hour mm. is now meant to be art. And inclusion is if you don't like it, you're out, mate. Yeah, yeah. And so therefore, yeah, it's, it's terrible. And art's got to be and always was the, the way that we used to push back against yes. authoritarian sort of totalitarian ways of, of living. But actually, it's in lockstep with it now. Well, it's, it's, it seems to me that it's actually a crucial kind of, it's like a visual aid for the orthodoxies now. Mm. You know, I mean, have you ever seen, uh, to tell me if you have, have you ever seen a play or read a novel or seen a piece of art that, for example, really criticizes multiculturalism, for example? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's inconceivable, isn't no. it? It, well, it wouldn't, no, you wouldn't get past any commissioner. No. It, no. They're, they're, as you say, it's an entire generation have been utterly brainwashed with this stuff. And they think, and it's, it's a sort of white guilt thing, mm. a white saviour thing. And that Malcolm X line of the w w most dangerous man uh, to a Negro is, say, is the white saviour. Yes. The white liberal, sorry. Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 these people are, their lives aren't getting affected mm. by this in their Hampstead mansions. But, you know, mm. their kids are getting stabbed 
on Primrose Hill now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. may maybe they will start to think, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, I'm not safe behind my giant walls, mm -hmm. and my and I'm not safe in my rich school in my, you know, Range Rover school every morning. Maybe the the you know the managerial elite class will will wake up to it. But I don't know. I mean, give you you don't see them going. We need more representation of. Uh, Multi, you know, different ethnicities. That after I quit, and I give the job to, oh yeah, yeah. You know, Adil Ray or something. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Yeah. So they, as long as they keep saying it, mm. and everyone else suffers, they hang on to their job and their paycheck. I think it's deeply cowardly and very racist, actually. Mm. I find that when I watch things like Netflix, for example, I've tried to <clears throat> trying to work this out, and it sort of took me a while. But I, I think I realised when you look at things that are highly recommended, whether they're films or dramas. You can admire all the production aspects of it, but then what is it? What is it that makes it not memorable? And for me, it's that the people I don't care, care about. <laughs> Did you know what I? 100%. I don't care. There's nothing at stake. I don't care about them. They seem to operate. You know, whether it's some sort of romance thing or whether it's a thriller. There's, there's no context about them anymore, is there? They're just warm props. Yes. We, we used to be joked about. Warm props. That, that's, what we, <laughs> that's what we used to joke about, you know, when you, we, as you were climbing the tree as an actor and you were sort of spear carrier number three, you just called yourself a warm prop. Right. But now the leads are warm props yeah. as well because we've, we're losing stars. So, you know, stars are making movies much less often. And we're being, we're being given a whole new batch of stars that aren't actually particularly motivating. And what the, their only function really is to deliver the political message of the film. Yes, exactly. It's not to, it's not to create an inner life which makes, transports you out of your own personal, you know, whatever you're going through, onto, into a screen, into the magic of a story. Mm -hmm. You're just watching people act as, as political plot functionaries warm propping their way into the next paycheck to you know give us another moral lecture from wokeland yes. in disney you know it's gone and also the people that are depicted they, they seem they, they they certainly have no religious um context for example or, or beliefs i assume um it's always assumed that they are politically probably liberal i mean all these messages come through in these very very minor ways but you know, it's, it means that one doesn't care, therefore loses interest. Mm. You, you said that we should start doing our own things. I mean, obviously, The Daily Wire, which has always been one of my, you know, I, I, I hugely admire The Daily Wire in America, um, which is a channel um, which is uh, probably at the forefront now, I would say. All, all right. um, they do do their own stuff, don't they? But then they have like a hundred million pounds of investment. Yeah. They do do films and they do TV shows and things, don't they? I spoke to an actor the other day about the Daily Wire, and um, he really made me laugh. Uh, he said that they are frustrated actors, a lot of them. Oh right, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> they made they made a film, this Lady Ballers film that they made, and they're all in it. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and I don't, I don't know if it's true, but it would be lovely if it was true. But yeah, they, they, they are very, very, mm. I think they, they would take a level of conservatism that not even we exist, yes. uh, you yeah. know, yet, with a very, very strident conservatism. But America is, again, ahead of us yeah. in terms of this. But we, I, th I, I really would be interested to... You know, if you imagine if you've got a great Graham Linehan, if you, yeah. his father Ted musical, if, you know, if someone or we together managed to go, right, we're going to put this on. And I bet you it would sell out in a flash. Yes. People would love to go and have a laugh. Yes. Because that's, that's it's, a, it's such, it's tonic mm. for the soul. But, mm. you, you know, you look at this comedian yesterday or the day before, say, get, getting the audience to say, oh. go off back to get out of palace. It's like, yes. you're a comedian. Yes. Make me laugh. Yes. Do you, do, do, I don't want. To, I don't need you to tick your woke credentials yeah. throughout your set, yeah. because that makes you exactly the same as everybody else, mm. not different. Yeah. And great art is different, mm. not the same. No, I mean, actually, is there any? Do you think there was is any um, mileage or or, or or even an opportunity to create what you might call a well a non left wing creative body? I you know, if you got together with people, 
I think there would. I think <coughs> there would be. You'd be very hard pushed to get actors to be in it. Though. Mm. Can you imagine going to a drama school and saying, um, I'm, "I've got this story about this, you know, kid who's struggling in, you know, a sort of Billy Elliot type mm. story, you know, set in amongst the kind of massive social and ethnic isolation of the north of England." It's a brilliant thriller, you know, brilliant, romantic, wonderful story. He, you know, but it's being produced by Lawrence Fox or, mm. you know, they, yeah. they, they'd go, I'm never going to work again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, they, it, you, you can do it. And it, we did it with the My Son Hunter film, but you've got to find people that have already stood up and, and been mm. cancelled, mm. mm. I think. And it will happen. We'll, we'll come, we will come together because it cannot, you know, that, that Yeats poem, like the centre cannot hold it. Just, it cannot be this, this way for, for too much longer. Yeah without there being some sort of inflection point. And if that inflection point, I, I just would love that inflection point to be very peaceful and mm. debated, mm. you know, mm. uh, rather than shutting down debate, shutting down debate, shutting down debate explosion, which mm. is what it feels like will happen. Yes, it, yes, it, yes, exactly. There was, um, yes, there's sort of two things open to us really, aren't there? There is that sort of basically that anybody who does sort of criticise or indeed stand up against what's happening, uh, will be closed down. Eventually people will bat it into submission. Right? Mm. Either that or there'll be some kind of conflagration of some sort. Right? Let's hope not. With that in mind, I'm sort of thinking forward like this year coming up in November, we've got the presidential election. I mean, that is, um, I think Trump will probably win that. I hope he does, personally. Um, can you see something there happening? I mean, like, you know, because it's such a divided country, isn't it? Mm. Can you see that there'll be some people who will be so incensed by this that in fact there'll be some sort of form of civil disruption? Or, I mean, could, can you say? Well, uh, you know, uh, what, they were very clever, the Democrats, weren't they? Because they, 65% of the Democrat votes were mail-in ballots and they got another 40 million voters, I think, in, yeah. the, in the last election, which yeah. has got, what, got Biden through the door. If they're trying to lock him up, you know, mm. they're trying to lock up the, mm. the opposing candidate. That's insane. Yeah, you know, yeah. that, that's, that's really bad. And I think that the, those that have been quiet, you, you can only push people so far. Yes, yes. And if he comes back in, it'll be a great thing because, you know, he's not a politician and that's why they don't like him. In the same way as Brexit wasn't a, the decision made by politicians. Trump is not a politician. Mm, mm. And that's what you sort of need at times mm. like this, someone mm. to shake it up. Uh, I think if, he'd, if they stop him coming in, I think, you know, I think it's probably an even chance that someone will try and take him out, won't they? Mm, That's mm. what will happen. But if he doesn't come back in, I think you'll see large parts of America either violently or non-violently just secede from, mm. the, from the coastal elite cities, which yeah. are, you know, just, they're so out of touch. Mm. But even Gavin Newsom is saying now, I mean, they're, all, they're in a big bind, aren't they? Because if Biden who- You mean the governor of- um, California, mm. but if, um, if Biden is in such bad cognitive decline, which he is, they can't get rid of Kamala Harris. No, no, and no. she's the most, more, more unpopular than he is. She's virtually a cretinous, isn't she? She's, she's I, I think I was listening to Victor Davis Hanson and he said that he thought he estimated her vocabulary to be somewhere between four and 500 words. Right. And yeah. she, she's just, you know, yeah. she's, I, I find her baffling. Yeah. I find all of, I find the fact that they've got a judge on the Supreme Court who can't define what a woman is, yeah. terrifying. Yeah. She's going to be there for life. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So it's, we, we will, America is definitely <coughs> where we've got, got to keep an eye on, but their free speech is protected in America and they've got guns to protect them. So mm. they're in a much better position than we are. Well, they actually don't have hate speech laws, do they? They can't have under the constitution. No. You know, this is something that a lot of people don't realise. You don't, you don't, don't hear it there. It allows as well, sorry to interrupt you, but it allow American free speech allows for flourishing rhetoric and mm. all of that sort of stuff. Yes. It's, it's written in the Constitution. So the, what I found so disappointing about this judgment was it said that your common, you know, your average person on the street wouldn't have understood what I was trying to do. Yes. And that's, in two ways that's wrong. They would. And why do we hold... Great British public in such low yeah, regard yeah, yeah. that they don't understand yes. because they do. And if you've got a divide as wide as it's becoming between the political class and the public, you've got a major problem coming your way. Just a word about reclaim. 
what's the situation now then with Reclaim, actually? Like, people want to know. I mean, you said to me last time <coughs> that you um, Reclaim at next election would stand in certain... Is that still what's going to happen? No, because there's no... I want to, I've, I've been trying for the last three years to say to the other guys, let's get together. Obviously, we're funded. We, we've got a good funding, and I'm saying to them, you know, let's work together and choose our seats and all that. But, you know, the seats that we would do well in are the seats where reform are going to stand. Mm. So, mm. you know, why would, why would I stand against them? I mean, yeah. unless you wanted to have a sort of who's more popular contest. But I do, I do, I'm, I'm interested in change. I don't care. It's the old quote of it's amazing what you can accomplish if no one takes the credit that Richard wants to work in the way that Richard wants to work, and that, that's his choice. It'll be interesting to see if Ben does well, then whether that puts Ben in a position to say, look, you know, mm, I'd mm. like more of a say here. Mm. But um, I don't see any point in standing people against reform party people, because why yeah, split an already small percentage of the vote? Mm. So we'll just let them get on with it and applaud from their side, and we'll do what we do mostly legally, but as the party will remain, and then, and it has to remain, because come the, there, as this conflagration that we've discussed already, when it happens, I imagine it'll happen quite quickly, and you're gonna need a political party there to go, mm. right, here we are, we need people to stand, and you need yeah. the infrastructure, and you know, we've, we, we know which are the right constituencies, and we know, you know various things, but why, why fight against Richard? Yes, yes, yes. Would, you, would there ever be a universe in which you, you would stand for reform, for example? He doesn't want anything to do with me. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't want anything to do with me at all. So I, I don't know why. I think he thinks I'm a bit, you know, and he's not wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> he thinks I'm probably a bit, you know, edgy for mm. the, the established tie-wearing, you know, class. But, you know, yeah. it's, uh, I've, I've asked, I've, I've said to him, look, stronger together. And, um, mm. you know, also we can help. We've got, I don't know, 100 odd thousand supporters, registered supporters. We've got a lot of people who want to help and work with us and they're dying to do something. Yes. But why stand them against Richard? Yes. But it puts in a very difficult position. Yeah. This is the problem with small parties. So I, do, I just, when it comes to, re, I, and also, you know, I, I think reform have some pretty, I don't think they're right on much either, mm. with all mm. due respect. I think mm. it's, it's quite passionless. I don't think they're interested in the culture. So I, I'd give them a sort of three out of ten as a party, but I'd give Ben Habib ten out of ten. Oh no, he certainly gets what we're talking about. Yeah, and he's very passionate yeah. about it. So yeah. I, I think that <coughs> it's it's right to it's right to support them and be gracious and support them anyway yeah. because they're trying to do something important. Um, but actually, I think rather than supporting, I don't support Reform UK at all. I support Ben Habib and I support. Rupert Lowe and I think the, especially I think over the pandemic Richard got it very wrong and I think he's got it very very I don't think he understands the culture so mm. I don't think he understands wokery properly and I don't think he understands what what's being done to our culture. Mm. I mean I think it sort of emerges anyway but um, do you it's, it's not a fair question anyway, but do you give in to despair over actually not? No, because I believe in God, so I mm. don't, which is one of the great bonuses mm. of faith. That really stops that, does it? Yeah, do, do not God. be afraid is about the most commonly used uh, phrase in mm. the Bible. Um, no, I'm not going to despair because I've got two kids. I mean, mm. I, yeah, we'd, we have our despairing moments, but ultimately you've got to pick yourself up and carry on. And, and I was speaking with Douglas Murray the other day because he phoned to check how I was doing, which was very kind of him, and we were talking about this very thing and he said the thing that you're doing which is so important is you're reminding people of one of the other great British virtues which was courage yes so you're exemplifying courage and it mm. doesn't matter whether you're way outspoken on certain things or you put your foot in it in other ways and all of that you are courageous and you yes. keep fighting and the more you can remind people that that is what we should be all we should all try and find our courage mm. the better yeah. and that's I think all we can do and yeah. um i've got two kids and i don't want them growing up in a country where they're discriminated against because they happen to be the children of two white parents yes i think it's wrong no i, I couldn't agree more i think the other uh, another reason to add to what Douglas said there at least one i <coughs> i feel quite often people say uh well you know you can comment on stuff all you like and this is all very good but what are you going to do and everything 
My feeling is, is that we have got to make sure that those people over in wherever it might be, Westminster, the political class, that they know that we do know. Yeah. That is really important, Yeah, actually. Um, and that is one way in which this function becomes a very, very valuable one, I think. And, your, and look, you know, your, your channel has grown huge since yes. I first met yes, on it. Yes, yes. I, again today, a taxi driver said to me, you know, <laughs> it's amazing how many taxi drivers are like... Oh, no, they're lovely. Yeah, but, you, but New Culture <laughs> Forum follow it, you know. And um, I think that what, what we're doing is we're creating a safe space yeah. oh, yes. to hold these very yeah, normal... Yeah totally uncontroversial yeah. views of loving your country, believing in borders, mm. criticising the fact that you have an open border you're into a welfare state is a bad idea, mm. saying that you should prioritise people who are born and live here mm. in housing ahead of giving out free phones and credit cards to asylum seekers who have come from countries where you can roam around following little schoolgirls around and saying no. Yes. There is a, a large constituency of people who are very against that, mm. who are also extremely tolerant of everything else. Mm. But you can't come into a country... I said this is another one of the problems of Islam. What is the age of consent in Islam? Yeah, yeah. There isn't one. Hence, the, they, they're not doing anything wrong, these guys that you mm. see over and over and over and over and over getting caught. Yeah. It's like, well, you've got to understand that in Britain we have an age of consent, we don't have blasphemy laws, mm. and we don't live under Sharia law. Mm. And if you choose to culturally self-isolate, mm. we're going to have a major problem, mm. which is that what Sula Braidman has been saying, and is ultimately the lesson that we've all learned of this absolutely, abjectly failed multicultural experiment. Mm. And I, I firmly believe that, you know, there are so, we always pick up on the bad news, but there are so many people from, from Muslims to, to, you know, black African families, to any, anyone who lives in this country totally loves our culture and our mm, systems mm. And, our, and our celebrations. You know, you look at the coronation and you see a sea of different coloured faces and, you know, political orientations. And they're behind the king because he's getting crowned and it's the coronation and that's mm. what we do in England, mm. you know. So mm. I do have hope. I mm. just think that, you know, the noisy minority, again, they're just so bloody noisy. Yeah. Well, noisy, but also just in incredibly powerful. Mm. Uh, there's no getting away from it. I mean, that's, that's what it is, I think. Mm. Thank you so much, Lars, for coming in again. Okay. And uh, thank you. Will you just stay with us just for a few, for our, for our special questions for our members? Um, but lovely to see you again, uh, Lawrence Fox. Um, we shall see you uh, next week. And don't forget, uh, as I said at the beginning, about those two, two events we've got in, in February coming up. OK, take care. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.